Hello friends, Del Ballou here with another art tutorial. This tutorial is going to be about how to paint a beach scape or beach scene in oils. I'm beginning in this video at least with a 16 by 20 stretch canvas. Um, I'm using one that has been wrapped around the edges. Um, typically called gallery wrapped. Um, with this particular canvas you don't necessarily have to frame before you can hang it on the wall. That's the advantage. But you can frame it if you like. I'm beginning with uh, my palette which is my typical palette. Sometimes I add other colors to it but I can do almost anything I want to do with these colors. And beginning over here, this is going to be the side for my cool colors and this side for my warm. These are important because they're opposites on the color wheel. That makes them complementary colors. What that means is that if you're working with a blue and you want to tone it down slightly, then you go to its complement which in this case would be orange and the cadmium red light is about as close to orange as we might get but you would only need a speck of that to tone down your particular blue paint. Now if you mix too much blue with too much orange you're going to uh, neutralize them which in the case of paint color means you're going to make gray or mud. So uh, experiment with that and see what happens when you mix complements together. Same is true for red and green, purple and yellow. Those are the primary colors that you want to consider when you're talking about complements. Now um, I have over here on my cool side I have um, Payne's Gray, which I use frequently to mix my greens. You can mix this with yellow, um, whichever color yellow you want to um, create, and you can neutralize it with a touch of red. Now, um, you can also mix brown with Payne's Gray by mixing pretty much equal parts of Payne's Gray, yellow, and red. And you do that to taste, as we might say if we were talking about food. Okay, and then we have Prussian Blue, which is a dark, rich blue. Uh, some people use Ultramarine Blue for their darks. I just haven't invested in a tube of that because I really like Prussian blue. Then we have cobalt blue, which is a color that I use most often in my skies. Then we have the titanic, titanium, excuse me, white. There is zinc white and flake white. I don't care for either one of those, but that would be up to you. Now we have cadmium yellow light cadmium yellow medium, cadmium red medium, cadmium red light, which is a little more on the orange side. Then we have alizarin crimson. If you mix alizarin crimson, Prussian blue, and Payne's gray mixed with a little bit of yellow to bring the green out, then you have a really nice, rich black color. I rarely use black, but you can. If I ever need black, I would go for the Payne's Gray. Then I use Burnt Sienna because it's one of my favorite colors. So that takes care of the paint colors. You will want to have always on hand a pair of pliers. Um, cheap pliers will work because the paint tubes are often difficult to open when they're older. 
Then I have Liquin. Liquin is made by Windsor and Newton, and it is a great medium for thinning your paints because the paint doesn't disperse into it. It maintains its character. Then it also causes your paint to dry faster and leaves a bit of a sheen behind. And you don't really need very much of this. And then we have odorless mineral spirits. The brand is Mona Lisa. I call it turpentine most often, but it is on the bottle it says mineral spirits. But I just use a regular old discarded jar and then I use a plastic pot scrubber in the bottom of my jar and that protects my paint from all these dregs that accumulate in the bottom from where we've used it the day before. And after it sits overnight, then the turpentine that's up in the top actually um, is clean again. So, plastic pot scrubber. Then, as far as brushes are concerned, um, probably my most favorite brush is um, this very long liner brush. And I used to have the name of this on here. I think it's Princeton, but I could be wrong about that. Um, Princeton Art and Brush Company um, sounds right to me, but, but notice how long these bristles are and they're very good for painting sea oats and if you're going to do very much of that I would highly recommend that you invest in one of these then we have a this comes in a number one or a number two this is a Betty excuse me better bird aqua sable brush and um, this one's a number one, but the zero would have finer hairs in it. But the other ones that I have are made by, um, okay, now I've forgotten. I'm gonna have to pull one out to remember. Um, but anyway, a fine liner brush. Then I have some bristle brushes this one happens to be very old and it's got paint dried up in it, so it's not very good for uh, smooth painting. But when you get to the point of doing grasses and things like that, um, it's wonderful because these bristles are spread out and they make nice little specks. Then I have this bristle brush which is much more flexible. It doesn't have paint dried up uh, near, near the finial or the ferrule, excuse me. And um, it's number two, Edward Degas, Degas series. Um, this is a smooth synthetic brush. Um, I do have wider ones, which I sometimes use for my skies or any part of the painting that I want to be smooth. This is the best case for that. Then the trusty fan brush. I have a variety of these. This happens to be a bristle brush and it works very well for doing um, the bases of the sea oats. But I will get into that later. Then this is my mixing palette knife. You can buy these in the plastic variety, very cheap. So that takes care of that. And I do believe that's pretty much everything. Um, I do use a plastic 
excuse me, I do use a paper palette pad because it's easier to transport. But I also use a piece of glass that, um, let me show you. I begin by painting my canvas um, whatever tone I happen to want at the time. In this case, um, blue seemed to be appropriate. So I'm using cobalt blue and some burnt sienna and I'm doing this in acrylics and then I paint over it with my oils. In addition to that, I put a piece of tape to mark my horizon line. Nothing worse than trying to establish a horizon line after the fact. And I'll be moving it at a certain point when I start to work on the water. But I'll cover that later. For my sky, I'm using the cobalt blue with a touch of alizarin crimson and white. For my clouds, I'm using a flat synthetic brush, but I do change to a filbert brush, also synthetic and soft. It's best to begin the formation of the clouds while the sky is still wet. That way you have a greater opportunity to blend in and to make some decisions about where to leave your heavier colors. In this case would be the darker blues and alizarin crimson. Insofar as the underpainting for the sand is concerned, um, there are actually two directions you could go in. Um, in this case, I have chosen to use the cobalt blue and burnt sienna, but after the fact, I decided I really didn't like it. Um, and then I went um, later, as you'll see, I changed this to a a bit more gray and a little less dark, but that's strictly a personal preference. Most of it's going to be covered up anyway, but for some reason um, I just didn't like what I was ending up with here. As I'm laying down this color for the sand, I'm also beginning to plan where the water is going to go and where the waves will go. And those things are part and parcel of just using my imagination as I go along. And um, it keeps me from actually trying to follow some photograph. But you'll see as I start to work on the water um, that I'm looking at highlights and shadows 
as they somewhat accidentally appear as I make my paint strokes on the canvas. Okay, let's uh, move on with this painting. Um, since last we met, um, I took my white bristle brush and my white paint, and I started thinking about where I wanted to place my sea oats. And um, I've decided that I'm going to use uh, this formation and I'm going to um, actually monopolize this part of the painting with these sea oats and sea grasses. Now, um, having decided that, I don't actually have to refer back to this painting because, well, I live on the coast and um, I know quite well how to configure my sand dunes. Um, this will be something of the background sea oats, which um, will be much smaller than, than these in the forefront. Um, but insofar as my water is concerned, I'm well on my way to having that completed. I will go uh, under these um, little white areas and create some more probably and put some um, shadow underneath them and then I will be doing some of the foam that remains once the, the wave has come in and then gone back out again to suggest that this is the ocean. And um, this is a photograph if you don't live near the beach and if you've never been to the beach, um, I would suggest that you take a little vacation, take your camera with you, and take uh, loads of photographs, different angles, and perhaps different tides. Um, high tide is going to be much different than, um, than this particular composition that I'm working on today. Um, I'm looking here among my photographs. Um, Obviously, the higher waves, and if you're closer to them, um, are going to be, a the shadow area is going to be a little higher, and the, the splash is going to be a little bit more vibrant, but my water is in the distance, and it's not the focal point for my painting, but this will be similar to what I'm going to be working on here because once I get these sea oats started, I can't make any other changes to my water. I um, wanted to point out uh, something that's going on in the sand dunes. Uh, in many places, not all sand dunes have these, but these are little vines that have leaves and then they grow um, little yellow flowers. So I'll be talking a little bit more about the sea oats, the sea grass, and the sand. But I've just kind of laid down some brushwork here to give me some idea where I wanted to go. So from here I'm going to be working on um, working on the water and um, Still not happy with my clouds. Um, I think my paint um, perhaps had too much medium in it because these clouds are not standing out like I'd really like for them to. And just a reminder, my sun um, or the, the light is gonna be coming in from, from this side, from the left side. So my highlight is gonna be on this side of these clouds and the same would be true over here except this is a very cloudy day the one I'm imagining so the Sun is not going to be extremely bright on my beach so 
let's just get started and see where we go from here. I'm back to my soft filbert brush for my cloud formation and I'm not pressing very hard onto my canvas. I'm using a fairly light touch because I I want my clouds to be fluffier on the top and I want them to slowly fade into the darker areas. And if I'm too aggressive with my brush, that is not going to happen. Okay, I have uh, put some shadows under waves and then I came back with my uh, pure white and just touched areas where I had put a shadow, thus giving not only a highlight but the sense of the waters breaking at that point. And um, I put a few of these um, foamy areas. They may need a little bit more shadow under them uh, once this paint has dried, but I'm going on now to uh, place my seagrass. And by the way, I used this soft synthetic brush um, this one's made by Robert Simmons, not to be confused with Richard Simmons. Um, these are really good uh, brushes. They're typically considered craft brushes, but whatever works is what I use. Doesn't matter what it's called. Um, and I could also use this liner brush for that. And maybe for some details, I will. Uh, certainly when I get ready to put in some birds, I may do that. So for now, um, I'm finished with the sky and the water for all intents and purposes. And now I'm going on to my foreground, my seagrass, sand dunes, and sea oats. As I'm planting my sand dunes and my sea grasses, I'm using a dark green um, just as a foundation. I can come back and I will come back and um, do several uh, shades of green and um, I will be paying more attention to the front sea oats and sand dune than the one in the distance. <clears throat> and what I have so far is, uh, is only the beginning. So when you're doing your beach scene, uh, you can place your sand dunes um, anywhere you like. And almost anything goes when it comes to sand dunes because they are, um, they're all over the beach. And they come in many shapes and sizes and they're, some are closer to the water, some are further away, and so this beach is in my mind and in my imagination, and you feel free to do whatever you want in your beach scene. As I'm applying these highlight areas, and continuing really to shape my sand dunes. Um, I'm just feeling my way here and for the most part I'm using uh, titanium white and I'm using a little of the gray mixture for the sand dune in the distance because I don't want it to take center stage and certainly don't want it to move too forward 
and the sand dune that I'm working on right here um, actually has sand that's coming down it's sloping down from the center and from the sides so you'll notice as I go along I'm trying to make that transition so that it's somewhat noticeable though in other cases uh, a little more subtle change I'm also leaving some spaces to suggest footsteps in the sand. I'll begin the session for today. I had to change my palette. I thought this might be a good time to introduce a little um, refresher here on the way I lay out my palette. Um, I have only put on this new palette what was left from the old one because I don't think I'm going to be needing very much of these colors today but if I do I have my paint tubes handy now I lay my palette out with cool colors over here warm colors here and the white in the center this is sap green viridian green Prussian blue cobalt blue titanium white cadmium yellow light and I haven't put any cadmium yellow medium but I will and this is cadmium red light cadmium red medium alizarin crimson and burnt sienna and I'm going to be working today on the sea oats but I wanted to show you some close-up photographs of sea oats in case you don't know what sea oats look like up close but this is this is from a distance slight distance and you'll notice that there are some light areas and some dark areas that are behind the ones up front so there'll be a variety of colors in these sea oats now these are later in the year probably um, this is well almost September so the sea oats would be turned this color now in actuality mine are not going to be quite like this but it just depends on what I like when I put the paint on the canvas but um, also these indicate that the wind is blowing from right to left. Mine are going to be somewhat kind of blown around, uh, not with a strong wind one way or the other, but they're very tall and very heavy, so it's quite natural for them to be sort of waving around in different directions. Okay, um, this is an up close and I'm going to try to get this closer so that you can see. I hope it doesn't blur out on me. Um, but you notice these little seed pods. These are the oats, of course. And notice the highlights and the shadows. But notice they're quite textured. So you'll want to pay attention to that when you're putting your paint on so that they have that appearance. And this is a little closer still. Um, again, notice the little, little grains, as I guess they would be called, and the stems. Here's another um, little photograph of the way they might look if they're being blown by the wind, all pretty much in the same direction. But notice all of these changes in color and highlights and shadows. Um, I'm going to be suggesting those and certainly not trying to do anything like um, detail. Now, this is a photograph of the last 
summer sea oats. I mean the very last, the fall even. Um, but notice how they've thinned out considerably. But one thing I want you to notice about these, even though they're pretty sparse and quite ugly, is that the sea oats are not just leaning in one direction. Some of them stand up and have a little different shape. And I'll be doing that in my painting just to give it a little bit more variety, a little more interest. So let's get started on sea oats this morning.
establish my sea oats, I'm using my long hair or long bristle liner brush, which is um, made by Princeton. And this is necessary to get a good start. Once I've established these, then I start to work on the tops. But this Princeton brush is excellent because it carries paint a lot further than some of the shorter liner brushes. I will eventually be going back to the distant sea oats to make those a little less golden, a little more green. To highlight my sand dunes, I'm using my brush, a uh, white bristle brush. I'm using it flat. And at some point when my paint starts to run low, I'm doing a lot of dry brushing. I'll go back over these several times before I'm finished. The one thing I don't want to do is highlight those back sand dunes very much because I want to keep them in the distance. This color that I'm adding to the sand dunes is to give a little bit more interest. And in fact, those uh, sand, that sand actually would be picking up a reflection from colors all around the sand dunes. The real secret is to know um, when to highlight and when to back off, when to add color and where to add color.
with this small bristle brush, I'm putting a few highlights in the sea oats. And remember that these sea oats are early, early summer or late spring, so they're still green. These are highlights only and not intended to be older sea oats as they will turn in the fall. In these final details, I'm highlighting the disturbed sand and indicating that the sand has been pushed up and therefore picking up a little bit of the light. There is a lot more I could do to this painting, but um, for those who have never painted a beach scene before, I've given a lot of information in this video. So I hope that you will like, share, comment down below and that you will certainly subscribe to my channel and see other videos that I have posted on my channel. And thank you for watching.